All right. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us for our final session of day one of ITW. This is a panel looking at how best to meet connectivity demands across urban, suburban, and rural areas, and it is being led by Gil Santales, who's the founder and CEO of NJFX. Gil. Thank you, James. So uh, this afternoon is our last session. Um, we're going to try and make it a little bit exciting for you guys and maybe have you guys ask some questions at the end, but please save them towards the end. Again, my name is Gil Santelis, the CEO and founder of NJFX. We're a cable landing station in Wall, New Jersey. Uh, we're the home of four subsea cables connecting Europe to North America, South America, and also access to the Caribbean. Uh, we founded our company back in 2015, and the idea was to have a carrier neutral cable landing station to have connectivity unrivaled. And today we have 35 network operators. This session is going to be about how to best meet the demands of connectivity in urban, suburban, and rural environments. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to take a few minutes to introduce themselves, and then I'll go into some of the questions that I have for you. So, right. yep. Hi, everybody. I know I'm, uh, we're, we're kind of like in between the, uh, the, the, the drink session and, uh, and, uh, and the last session of the day. So let's see. Let's, let's hope to make it as entertainment, uh, entertaining as possible. But uh, my name is uh, Joop, Joop Gerlag. It's a Dutch name, so I don't, you, you, it doesn't really matter how you pronounce it. Um, uh, we started Blue Wireless in 2015 with the uh, concept of, uh, of thinking outside of the wires, outside of the box, and, uh, and provide fixed wireless access to uh, multinational enterprises. Um, the world is going wireless, and that was our vision. And today, we see actually that, uh, that more and more companies are asking for wireless solution and fixed wireless solutions in, in all of their connectivity requirements for uh, business continuity or even primary connectivity areas. So that's where we're, uh, that's where we're at, and that's, uh, that's uh, what I represent. Hello, and I'm uh, Chris Gatch. I run corporate development for DC Blocks. We are a um, data center. Um, we, we design. Uh, build and operate data centers across the southeastern United States, and we also develop um, large capacity uh, fiber optic networks. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of the projects we have underway when we get a little bit further into the session. Uh, hi, I'm Peter Cohen. I'm with Microsoft, and I'm working on NetFlow and um, IP security related things, but I've spent the last 25 years looking at rural and urban networks and connectivity for con customers all over the world. I'm Alan Meeks with Mox Networks, COO and President. Uh, Mox's impetus was a healthcare network to, to build out for personalized evidence-based medicine. Um, we overbuilt a lot of capacity, and so we turned to the telco space adjacency and are selling excess capacity. Basically do three things, dark fiber spectrum or dark fiber channel and wavelengths. How you doing? Pat O'Hare, COO of Zenfi Networks. Zenfi Networks is a neutral host provider and fiber optic network operator in New York, New Jersey area. Recently acquired by BAI Communications and we will be rebranded as Bolden Networks as of July 1st when we integrate with the other three US-based businesses that BAI has acquired over the past few years. Thank you, Patrick. And, and there's lots of challenges, obviously, in building out connectivity, but specifically in the rural areas and, and suburban, and then even the urban environments. You would think urban would be a little bit easier, but, but I'm sure it comes with its fair amount of challenges. I'm very familiar with Zenfi, I know the project uh, New York City Link. Can you tell us more about how that project came about and where you are with it today? Sure, so Link is the largest free public Wi-Fi network in the world, and we only have it halfway built out. We are currently deploying about 80% of the kiosks outside of uh, Lower Manhattan. Um, it's a multi-tenant, multi-service siting solution that really accelerating the pace of 5G deployment in our New York City urban environment. Because we have this multi-tenant solution, once we put a link out, we can house up to five carriers inside of uh, each one of our new Link 5Gs. Um, you know, part of the purpose of this public-private partnership that created Link is really bridging the digital divide. You know, 33% of the households in, in uh, New York City don't have a combination of home and wireless broadband, and 18% have neither of both. 
on top of what we're doing with the kiosk, we've also created five what we call gig centers, one in each one of the five boroughs, where we go to community centers and we provide free public Wi-Fi for places like Digital Girl in Brooklyn, where um, they are championing STEM programs for uh, young ladies in, in the borough of Brooklyn. The Andrew Friedman House in the Bronx, where we are teaching uh, seniors computer literacy utilizing our network. Um, La Colmena in Staten Island, where we are, uh, you know, migrants that are coming and looking for work. They have a, a, a place where they can go where they uh, can speak in their native language and learn com computer skills and also access city services. So I'm fascinated with your project because I grew up in New York City and I used to walk by these pay phones. And you've taken advantage of pay phones. Is that how you came about developing this project with pay phones in New York City? Yeah, the original concept was to replace all of the pay phones in New York City with these link kiosks. The difference is it's all free to the public. So there's free nationwide calling, there's free city services, free public Wi-Fi, there's a 911 button, uh, free uh, wireless charging, no juice jacking, it's not uh, connected to anything where uh, anything can be downloaded. We've cut all the pins on that to avoid any uh, anybody juice jacking. So all these different, like I said, multi-tenant, multi-service solution with the kiosk, the original kiosk being a little bit smaller, but now what we're doing to uh, accelerate the pace of 5G deployment in New York City is we've created these large 32-foot um, tall uh, Link 5G kiosks, which 32 feet is the same height as a street light. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. So while you know people might call them uh, large, gargantuan, a lot of other adjectives, they're the same height as a street light. Like anything else, they'll fit into the urban environment once people get used to them. But they are providing a vital public service. So New York City is one of the biggest cities in the world, but yet not the only big city. Will you be going to other cities around the U.S., other cities globally with the payphone model and doing this application? Yeah, we're exploring other connected communities throughout the United States with our partnership with another BAI company, uh, Mobility, who does a lot of work um, creating DAZ and venues, how we can you know, place these kiosks in the parking lot and increase the halo of connectivity for folks at venues. And also um, another, you know, public-private partnerships like Hudson Yards and Industry City where they've come and revitalized these old warehouse areas. We're looking to do partnerships as well like that to provide those public, wi those public Wi-Fi services out on private property. Fascinating. Thank you, Pat. So, so Peter, um, this has been done before, not been done before. What's your take? What's the, the model? So I think the private-public partnership is really key in doing this. Uh, this morning I was talking to a buddy of mine in Texas who was rolling out fiber to the home in the rural areas, and I certainly spent a lot of time looking at internet capacity and speeds to users at home, and he gave me this one quick anecdote, which was a family of four during COVID, working out of the house, uh, the mom was an architect, trying to download files over a six meg DSL link. Kids are at home from college, COVID's full on, the husband's at home. They basically were taking turns using the internet at home because they couldn't do everything at once during COVID. Out rolls this ISP from Texas with fiber to the home, delivers only 100 meg, the lady breaks down and cries because she was afraid she was gonna lose her job. And now, totally solved with fiber to the home. So the answer is public-private partnership. Huge fan of that. Um, you know, I think it's great stuff you're doing. Thank you. So I'm gonna switch gears for a moment and switch to DC Blocks, Chris. So your business, I know, right? It's similar to ours, but yet it's different, right? You've got a cable landing station in Myrtle Beach, and right. you've got data centers in these tier two markets. So right. tell us about your business and how do you help some of the markets that you have with connectivity? Yeah, well, to your point, we actually started uh, in the Southeast building data centers in tier two underserved markets. So we built um, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Huntsville, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, then we built Greenville, South Carolina. And because we had the expertise operating in the South and understanding how to operate in smaller markets, we ended up having the opportunity to build a subsea cable landing station in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. 
So to your point, Gil, similar to your business, we have a, a CLS there. There's um, already one cable that is announced with more coming. Um, it's been a very successful project. And, and in addition to building a cable landing station, we also built high capacity fiber network, a, a five duct system, basically an interstate highway of fiber that connects the cable landing station all the way back to Atlanta and key points of interconnection like 56 Marietta. So you, to your point and kind of what you were saying, we've, we've seen in some of our markets similar public um, Wi-Fi initiatives and or fiber to the home initiatives in Huntsville, Alabama, for example, is a Google fiber market and we've definitely seen some roll out. Interestingly, with the cable landing station, um, there was a one of our customers partnered to do a municipal Wi-Fi project in Myrtle Beach at the state park where the cable lands. Uh, and so we wired that. But probably the most impact from a, a, a rural broadband perspective for what we're doing is you know, driving infrastructure where it didn't previously exist. So Myrtle Beach, for example, had an economy that was primarily around uh, tourism. They had a very you know, one-dimensional economy. And so part of what made our investment in that city so important to them was the beginning to diversify their economy with tech investment and also drive fiber deployment into their city that really wasn't there from a large capacity standpoint before. And then also, as we build our fiber routes that we construct, although they are long haul, long haul fiber is necessary in order to enable local fiber. So everywhere that we run a route, every thousand feet is a, is a, is a, is a manhole that you can take fiber off of and spur out and start to serve areas. And in the case of our cable, that runs from Myrtle Beach to Atlanta. It runs through a lot of underserved areas in Georgia and South Carolina. So your business now is Southeast Data Centers. That's right. A fiber company and a cable landing station. That's right. And are you enabling any kind of urban, suburban, rural broadband connectivity? Or are your customers doing that? Like, how do you play a role in? Yeah, so most of what we're seeing from that standpoint, um, and, and we, do, we do some urban fiber development, so nothing that we have publicly announced yet, but we do build fiber optic rings around certain markets, again, where it makes sense to connect our data centers. But more importantly, all along our route that runs from the first route we, we built from Myrtle Beach to Atlanta, there are rural um, telephone companies, cable operators, and partners along that route. And we are selling fiber to many of them who are using our backbone as an element of driving uh, further broadband penetration into the areas that they serve. So you're really like a backbone enablement of these fiber to the home operators that are turning around and taking your assets and then using them to create these communities of connectivity. That's right. Okay. Yep. So this kind of ties in a little bit to Chris, I'm sorry, to Alan, my apologies. Alan, in your business, you're primarily doing large backhaul passing these communities? Yeah, so I mean, kind of similar to what Chris is talking about there with DC Blocks, I mean, minus the data center and CLS piece for us, but you know, we, we're gonna, we've we been doing long haul builds for eight or nine years. Um, long haul's really tough, um, not that urban's you know, easy by any means as well, but you know, you're piggybacking on some other right away always, you know, gas, power, rail, and so understanding you know, their safety concerns on their right aways is really important and having a reason to actually do the long haul build, some foundational customer, which typically ends up being, you know, we need to build between cities to connect data centers and or we need to build out to a landing station for sub C. But to Chris's point, very similar things happen. Once you have that foundational customer and you've done the build, you have access points along those routes and the, the sort of one, two combination that works for rural broadband is some type of metro network, but you have to have the backhaul. If you're gonna build islands of fiber, and you're going to be held, you know, strangle held by the cable company and the ILEC for backhaul, you're never going to get anywhere. Yeah, I want to add to that, that I think it can't be understated the importance of existing or building fiber from some city to a place where it can reach somewhere else as, you know, the backhaul. And so you can do all you want in some town in rural Texas or Oklahoma or Minnesota or wherever you are, but unless that transport exists back to Minneapolis or up to Denver or down to Dallas or wherever it may be, you're just building an island that's got great connectivity within the downtown center to itself, but can't actually go anywhere on the internet because the transport out of there is non-existent. And that, even in the states now, you know, especially in underserved areas or what have you, cannot be understated how important that fundamental 
underlying capacity is. And I would say that's not just for, you know, say the rural broadband expansion, but if these cities want to end up getting on the tour list with the, the larger tech companies in, say, the surrounding markets, without that, it's great to have an island of fiber, but without that backhaul, you're not getting on those tour lists, right? And I think that's a big part of raising the tax base for these communities is giving them the tools that can allow them to, first of all, stay in their lane as a municipality, which, you know, really the lane for a municipality is good stewardship of the right of way. You know, don't become a provider city. Don't try to provide services or compete with service providers. Really just create the conditions to, to invite competition to your market, right? I think it's that one, two thing. You gotta have the, the regional networks, but you, you have to have some backhaul as well. So, you know, after the fact of doing, you know, having a foundational reason to build to a landing station is great, but also creating access points and being mindful of the future as you're building that so that when these communities are gonna be you know, up and coming at some point, you've already got access points off of your right away, whether that's gas or rail, you know, that's the trouble is after you've built some long haul, how do you go back and access that cable to let these communities in? A big part of that is you know, thinking ahead in your right away agreements with rail or gas or power and creating those access points ahead of time that are gonna make sense for them. Yeah, we're finding the same thing on a micro level of what Alan and Chris are talking about, building out the fiber, pro uh, building out the kiosk project. You know, we're connecting every one of those kiosks with dedicated fiber. So we're going to the, uh, you know, the far reaches of Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island where, with highly accessible fiber counts. You know, typical networks were built either very dense or very accessible. We've actually got a hybrid solution there so we can, they are both dense and accessible so that we can drop cables anywhere we want at an MDU, at street furniture, bus stop. Um, housing development, but it, it's on a micro level here from exactly what Chris and, and Alan are talking about. We're pushing fiber into places where cable companies and the ILEX are, are not investing because so, of that foundational reason. Before I switch over to Yope, and I do want to hear about the rural area and how you're serving that, tell me a little bit about how, what percentage of your business is supporting backbone for these local communities that need to get in and out of their communities from your perspective? I mean, it's nothing personal to these communities, but they just don't have a lot of traffic. So they, they, they frankly are kind of an afterthought. I mean, we, we are building foundationally for something much bigger that's gonna fund it, but it's not an afterthought in, uh, a, it's more of an afterthought in business case, but in engineering and planning, we're certainly thinking about the potential for these communities. And like I said, creating the access points that are gonna make sense for them in the future. But it doesn't comprise, you know, a lot of the, the backbone capacity or even the business case to do these builds. Um, because, you know, in these rural areas, there just isn't a lot of people, which means there's not a lot of traffic, not a lot of demand, so the economics don't work as well. All right, yo. All right, well, I think that's where wireless comes in, and uh, wireless can actually make a, a, a heap of a difference. A, it is very fast in deployment. Even though the fiber might be readily available, it still takes you probably a month to actually get it terminated at the, at the right location in the right, uh, right area. You know, we deliver anywhere between six days and 10 days in 87 countries. Uh, whether or not it's rural or not, it doesn't really matter. We can actually provide a, a very decent, uh, decent, uh, decent environment. And it's also, you know, from a speed perspective, we started with 3G first, which was uh, which, uh, definitely challenging. Um, but now with 4G and 5G coming along, it's actually uh, very, very um, doable from a speed perspective. And it's, it's more an access methodology to end users and to end corporations. If you want to have a data center connectivity between data centers, that that's definitely requires fiber. Um, but at least you can start with, uh, with some of the wireless technology. Even with point-to-point -point on 5G, you can actually get tremendous speeds. Um, um, yeah, not only in, uh, in the continental US, but, uh, you know, Go to Canada, go to Mexico, go to Brazil. There's definitely so many areas out there that need connectivity. Um, and I do think wireless is definitely the first step that, uh, that we can all take in order to, uh, to get that, uh, that, that connectivity to particularly the end user, but also the rural areas as well. Even though they don't have that much traffic, they, they do have some traffic. It's not only sheep there. <laughs> much easier when you don't have to worry about the right away. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, so yo, tell us, I mean, I need to learn this, right? So you put up two dishes, you connect the dots, and that's it? You don't call anyone, no permissions, just fire away? Well, that's, that's sort of how it works, yeah. It's, a, this, it's the, 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 the service that we deliver, the fixed wireless access solution, is using the, the, the SIM providers in-country, so local SIMs, 
that is already connected to the internet. So it's already regulated and licensed. So you can use that service as, or you can resell that service capability. Um, and then, you know, from, if, if it's a real rule and they are too far from the, from the nearest base station, you need to in, indeed install an antenna in order to get there. But, you know, um, I don't know how much it is in miles, et cetera, but at least a 50 kilometer radius is, uh, is uh, what we can actually use for, uh, for connectivity. And one last question, Peter, before we go there. Where in the U.S. would I find your applications? Everywhere. So we, we, we deliver uh, tertiary uh, failover capability for a large pharmaceutical. Uh, we provide um, another fixed uh, wireless access for logistical developments. So everywhere where people are in need of connectivity or more security or business continuity, that's where the, the fixed wireless access comes into play. And, and, one, and, and that includes urban environments like a New York City? Everywhere. We do. We, 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 we connected 333 sites for Coach, Coach, the handbag carrier co company. We, we, we do Nespresso sites everywhere in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the world. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a common denominator for, uh, for those, uh, those, those retail outlets for sure. Peter? Yeah, so a uh, big fan of, of fixed wireless stuff. A uh, little anecdote since it's story time, because everybody wants to get out of here at some point. Uh, 2012, took a trip to Finland, uh, was working for Netflix about the launch of Netflix in Finland. Four of us went, uh, met all the ISPs, sat down with one of the large cable guys, and he said that fixed internet was declining in customer base there already. So in 2012, and I had him say it like twice or three times because I wanted to make sure he said what I thought he said, which was people were place, replacing home internet access with wireless access, wireless data, mobile data, back in 2012 in Helsinki. And that was kind of always sort of the cutting edge country, South Korea and Helsinki for wireless development. And they were way ahead of of the states in 2012 with this and sort of I came to the conclusion that our kids and they and they don't and they won't ever have it which is they will probably never live with fixed internet at home they would only ever have sort of mobile data and so for the consumer probably down the road your house may favor you know or have a fixed you know fixed internet or you know broadband access um, off your cell phone plan or something instead. So the future was in Finland in 2012 and is probably, you know, processing through the rest of the world at this point. I'm going to switch gears for a moment talk about talk about 5G. 5G has been a big promise for a long time. It's going to revolutionize the world, Internet of Things, everything will be connected all the time, very inexpensive, very robust. I'll leave this open to the group. Is it happened? Do we have 5G? Is it everywhere? And I'll, I'll start off with that one. But uh, yes, 5G is already uh, is already there. It's uh, it's it's happening, but it's heavily marketed by the telcos as the as the new Valhalla of uh, of, of solutions. Um, it it is far more difficult to deploy uh, 5G in a um, in a uh, in an environment, particularly in a rural environment. Because the, the 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 signal doesn't travel that far, so you need to actually have multiple solutions in order to get the signal into uh, into buildings. Again, right, the 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 millimeter band frequencies are so high that if you put your hand in front of it, the signal doesn't go through. So you do need to have a far more um, capable solution in the rural areas in the urban areas in order to actually propagate that system and that signal into buildings. So it will take probably another three to four years before we actually can get um, a more uh, capable system. But the promise of 5G is still there. It has slicing, you can do classes of servers, you can do all kinds of things with 5G that you can't do with 4G and it's, 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 a, it's a better methodology and it's a, it's, a, it's a much more speedier network capability that will actually meet the customer demands. It just doesn't meet them yet. Thank yeah. you. Alan? I mean, where, where I see it, 
is where it makes sense, right, economically, which is urban environments. But to Yope's point, you need, the signal doesn't go as far. So really where, where we see it popping up, at least for us, is in dense fiber areas where there's already dense fiber. Uh, and you need more of the density of fiber for it to happen. So I think they're going to go hand in hand, and the pace of that uh, deployment will probably be directly relative to the density of fiber being built. You know, Helsinki, South Korea, they're great places, okay, nothing against them, but, but they're a lot smaller and there's a lot less people. And sort of the Achilles heel of the United States, or at least North America, is it, the thing that makes it so great, all the space, is also what makes it so difficult to have long haul builds between markets, right? And put the density of fiber in rural areas. I mean, that, that takes a business case. That's easier to do in a small environment with tens of millions of people, like in say South Korea, um, much harder to do in the United States for, for lots of reasons. But all the long haul put in in 98 through 2003 pretty much in the US is aging out now. And we've got to figure out new long haul networks in this country or we're all gonna hit a cliff at some point where all the new Sienna gear is not gonna operate on this old fiber. Uh, you know, coherent systems are getting more and more sensitive and so we need that, that new fiber. But the, the 5G deployments I think are just gonna be mirroring where you know, the density of fiber is. Without the density of fiber, you're not gonna have the deployments. Alan, I agree with you. I think right of in our country is the biggest challenge we have. You mentioned the Nordics. They've done a phenomenal job in terms of once you announce you're going to trench, everyone gets, gets the notice, and you can all drop your cable in at the same time and share the cost of the trench. I don't know why we don't do that in the U.S., but we don't. But it makes at least backhaul and long haul much more affordable in the Nordics. We've seen the one dig initiatives in states. We've seen them in cities. But yeah, I mean, across the entire country is going to be difficult because most of the fiber is either on gas, power, or rail. Some departments of transportation, some public stuff. But to be honest, the public stuff is kind of more difficult because it, it moves, especially if something, if a place develops where you put the fiber in, the road gets bigger, you're relocating. Rails don't move, gas doesn't move, but you're always second fiddle to rail and gas in terms of safety. So as you do your high level design engineering, permitting, yeah, the row really becomes sort of the, the, the tough part of the model is to, you know, how do you put a whole business case around a piece of real estate you don't actually own? You know, real estate folks and data center folks can understand the fiber business to a point. But when we get down to, yeah, we don't actually own that right away, it's a lease with the gas company and we're at their mercy for access and engineering, that becomes a difficult thing for, for people to swallow. Peter? Uh, yeah, I was going to say to Alan's point, um, I had a quote a long time ago, I think it's still applicable, which was, you're responsible for your own redundancy. So in the build out of rural communities, if there's a, not at least two ways out, preferably three ways out, you know, ideally four ways out, you know, you, you want to have that infrastructure in place so that when something goes bad, and something always goes bad, something always gets cut, you're still up and operational even after that. I think I'm gonna do a quick plug for a company that's not here, I don't see them in the audience either, but it's a company called Confluence, and they've got a cable system they're gonna put off the coast of the, in the Atlantic Ocean, from the coast of the East Coast, and they're gonna connect Wall, Myrtle Beach, Virginia Beach, Jacksonville, down to Boca, for the express reason everyone here is mentioning, there's a huge gap between Ashburn and Atlanta, and the fiber that exists is sparse at best, and it's not redundant. So having an alternate route in the water using subsea cables might be the way we fix the East Coast problem, but you still have a whole East Coast to West Coast issue. Pat, you know, in terms of 5G New York City, many of us go to New York, and it's changed in the last couple of years. Got a lot more homeless folks that are running around but they all have cell phones. You know, they'll ask you for a cup of coffee, but they'll have a phone next to them. How does 5G change New York City? I mean, all of the applications that come with 5G are for everyone, right? We can't bridge the digital divide and forget about some of those folks that may need access to city services to possibly turn, them, turn their lives around. So that, that's what we're thinking of as part of this is, is really digital equity. Um, your question before about, you know, is 5G really here? It's really here, but I think, um, you know, there's a couple of barriers to the ubiquity of it. One is there's still supply chain issues with carriers getting radios 
And then there's still, you know, the onerous task of whether or not you're going across municipalities or in public right away, like gas or railroad, or you're in a dense urban environment with 5G and there is a lar long laundry list of city agencies that put together onerous tasks that you have to you have to do before you can deploy these things. So I think that's one of the beauties of, of Link is it's it's less onerous to get a link out on the street and now you have five opportunities for carriers or CBRS to co-locate inside inside of this one siting solution instead of the mobile telecom franchise, of which Zenfi is a partnership with the city as well having either just one or two in a multi-tenant solution. So, you know, broadband's for everybody. Um, you know, it's, it's not just for those who can necessarily afford it. You know, kudos to the administration in the city of New York to actually take pay telephones and provide free public Wi-Fi. I think they saw the advent of everybody having a phone you know, I, I gave a statistic before about 18% of the homes not having either mobile or home broad access to broadband, but during the pandemic, the city of New York handed out Chromebooks and tablets to the students. Um, and we saw the, the connectivity from the existing links penetrating into these homes and people being connected for long periods of time during COVID. I mean, we, even, we see people with their Xboxes li linked to the free public Wi-Fi out there, so it's getting penetration, not only on the street, but even into some of the apartments that these things are in front of. But, you know, we have, we, we feel that broadband's for everyone, you know, and it needs to be spread around. And the advent of 5G and the applications that it brings, you know, if you think about it, right, there's a new movie out about the Blackberry and it was like, hey, you can have your phone and your email together, but you know, we're, we're looking at PowerPoints, we're watching, we're streaming movies on airplanes. On, on phones now, it's just the applications. The applications that are really gonna come out probably haven't even been invented yet that once we get the throughput and the speed of 5G ubiquitous, it's gonna be amazing. I think the core of, uh, of some of the 5G discussion and, uh, and, uh, and the wireless discussion is on, okay, how do companies going to integrate the 5G element versus the, um, the wireless en uh, elements? Are they going to invest in security policies for both the wireless as well as the 5G environments? Or are they just going to decide to use 5G as their uh, edge computing uh, capability and, uh, and, uh, and drive the security parameters for, uh, for their business needs that way? I think there's a, there's a, there's a kind of like a deep discussion going on in, uh, in the corporate, uh, corporate world on how do I use this new technology or this technology to my advantage from a, uh, from a, from a, from a business development perspective? And I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree, broadband is for everybody and I, I don't understand why it's not for everybody. If, if there's, is, it, is it not for everybody? <laughs> well, Gil, Gil made the point that there was unhoused people with <laughs> cell phones. <laughs> so uh, I was, I was uh, right. countering his point. Look, you make a good point, right? You have to include everyone to be, have a society. You can't, you can't have the haves and the have-nots. Yes, and that, and that again, that, that access to services might be the leg up that that person needs, either to access services that will assist them or to make contact with family if they've, you know, they've been out. You know, it's Mental Health Awareness Week. So, you know, there, there are folks that are out there that are not necessarily, they're just walking around, they might be depressed. You know, these things are, you know, that access is, is critical. I want to bring Chris into the conversation because the Southeast is something I'm not familiar with. Do you have anything like this in your neck of the woods? 5G proliferation, you know, wireless providers providing an entire metro with access to internet? I mean, to be honest, I, c I can't think of a direct parallel, not, not certainly at a large scale. I mean, I've, I've, w what is happening a lot in the South is there's a lot of fiber to the home development occurring right now. Um, you know, and, and that's not in small part because of all of the government funding that has gone into enabling rural broadband through the you know, pandemic relief funds. Uh, we've got all the NTIA middle mile grants that are driving long haul infrastructure deeper into, uh, into communities. So I've seen um, there, there are a number of markets where the fiber to the home investment is occurring and pockets where that's occurring. Uh, you know, there, there are some municipal fiber um, investment examples, Chattanooga, Tennessee, not necessarily so much fiber based, but um, both cable and fiber had a, 
you know, major uh, rollout of broadband all across their city. They called themselves the gig city after they did it. Um, and now they're trying to become the 10G city. Um, Huntsville, Alabama did a big, uh, not rural, a big municipal fiber rollout um, that they sold part of to Google and became a Google fiber um, investment. So I see pockets like that, but not necessarily as, as large from the wireless standpoint. Most of what I've seen on wireless are just from the major carriers, at least I'm aware of. Let's segue into fiber to the home for a moment. Let's say we're successful as a country getting fiber to the home. How do, how do things change? Didn't we already have, we had copper to the home, right? Everyone had a phone at home at one point. Now we're gonna get fiber to the home. Peter, walk me down the future here. What happens when we get fiber to the home to a, to a decent critical mass? So uh, I guess speaking on behalf of myself, who I live down the street, so to speak, in Northern Virginia, you know, we have gig internet access. We've had it for more than 10 years there. We never think of anything other than sort of immediate internet access to the sites that are wired on the other side, you know, being well wired, right? Because, you know, you're only, if, if you understand how the internet works, it's really only as fast as the weakest or slowest link, right? So if you're going someplace far away and it's only connected at a meg, you're, you're not really gonna get some magical speed more than a meg to it because it's the speed of the slowest portion that you're going to. So, you know, the future is kind of ubiquitous uh, connectivity, meaning that you have as fast a speed as you need without thinking about it all the time. I think I looked this morning, I have 34 devices connected in a house of four people, right? I've got the washing machine, the freezer, the fridge. I think the dishwasher is now like has its own life and connected on its own, I don't even know. But all of these things are connected. I don't worry about it. It's nailed up 24 seven. It basically never ever goes down other than we actually had a physical fiber cut and it brings reliability to everyday things. Our teachers are connected in that school district super well. The schools are connected. We're VPN'd in at work. So it's really just, you know, and, and to be honest, I got really good Aruba access points. You know, so we're really connected well in the house 24 seven, you know, without even thinking of it. So the future is, you think of it as when you turn on a light switch and the light, the electricity works, you turn on the water and the water goes on, you fire up your laptop, you can go anywhere on the internet, it functions much like a utility with, you know, 100% reliability. That being said... It's amazing how many calls I get from my <laughs> friends if their fiber goes down. E exactly, right, and your their, friends... Their kids are using... Uh, your dishwasher doesn't use that much bandwidth, <laughs> by the way, but right. their kids do. The kids do. And, and that being said, you know, we're, we're lucky we're wired with fiber, everything's cool. There's certainly a play for being, I'm gonna call it multi-homed at home, which is I've got my wired internet access or you know local wireless or what have you I also have a backup plan maybe on the cell service in case that does go down that has good connectivity and I'm not sure I've got that on my mobile service that could pick up the slack should my fiber go down so yo I'm gonna come to you after I ask um, Alan this question first so is this a big part of your business plan going forward all these fiber to the home companies are getting funded the private equity dollars have been spinning their way. They're all popping up all over the country. Is that a big part of your plan today, or will it be in the future, or both? Yeah, I think it's modifying the existing long haul that we're building today, being mindful of that stuff, and then watching to see where a lot of that money goes, and then talking with those folks that are building those quote-unquote islands of fiber, and you know, really the, the, the types of companies that are, again, approaching the municipalities and you know, telling them the right story, which is, like I said before, stay in your lane, be a good steward of your right of way. You know, cities already have public works departments, but they don't have knocks. You know, so just stick to what you do, you know, make the permitting process easy. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's where it fits in for us, right? Is that on the existing routes we've built, we've sort of, we have the ability to liberate all these communities, you know, from the stranglehold of the, the, the ILEC or the cable company and backhaul, which, which opens up those possibilities, yeah. I like the point you're making about stay in your lane. Is it, do these municipalities do a shakedown? 
depends. I mean, yes, yes and no. Especially, I mean, if you're Facebook building through town, right? They're gonna, their eyes are gonna get big, right? Uh, and, but you know, even when we come through town and we're wearing a red cross on our shoulder talking about curing disease, um, I think it's just more of a, a disconnect between, you know, what the FCC says and how things are regulated versus what, you know, some some state uh, administrative code says versus what a city charter says. And so you run into a city that, you know, is misinterpreting the disconnect between those three pieces of language. And, you know, it's not that they shouldn't have their hand out and get paid for their right-of-ways, that's not the point. The point is uh, streamlining it for the people that are building through your community like long haul versus franchising for the people that are building access. It's a big difference. And the, the hoops you have to jump through just trying to build a long haul network, even if you are on a gas right away, you're coming through a city and they, they want to know who you are if you're accessing the, the handholds. And they want to make sure you know, you, you, you've got the, the, the correct title and ownership of everything. You know, you've got the insurance requirements you've got. And then once they have all that, of course, they're, they're going to stick a franchise agreement in your face, right? Um, which again, I, I'm not opposed to, to paying fees to cities for access to the right-of-ways, but we're, we sort of have this square peg that we're trying to cram into a round hole as we're building through communities. I think it's really the disconnect in, in regulation. You know, what the FCC says about how it's regulated, what a state code might say, and what a city charter might say, and then a person responsible for right-of-way in that city interpreting and misinterpreting all three of those things and applying it you know, to you versus think, seeing you like a Comcast when you're just building through with long haul. That's been a big challenge. I'm getting a flashback. I used to own a fiber company in New Jersey, and we have 550 municipalities, 23 counties, and it was a nightmare getting local access fiber through all these towns and the counties. But what I realized is state right-of-ways was one agreement and no permission, just go ahead. So the name of the game was stay on state roads, and they, could, and they couldn't charge you, by the way. The, the state could not charge you, which was nice. Um, but I agree, railroads and gas lines, it could be really overbearing at times. Uh, Yope, in terms of your business and fiber to the home, is it a big part of your plan? Not impactful? We're not really doing uh, uh, consumer great, uh, great internet access, right? So it's, uh, it's a bit, bit of a different story, although uh, I have fiber to the home, but I have a fixed wireless internet access, and I have a Starlink as a tertiary uh, um, uh, um, uh, access uh, backup kind of thing. But you know, it's uh, it's uh, definitely a uh, a view that that I think everybody should have fixed wireless access to the to the home. Um, most of the carriers actually give it for free. Um, they don't monitor it, they don't manage it, so it's not always sure that it actually works. But it will become more and more and uh, and more and more capabilities. And you know, you take your mobile phone with you as well, so you might as well have uh, have a uh, a wireless access at home as well. We only have a few minutes left, and I got two topics. I'm hoping we can get some good, meaningful conversation. AI is the old rage, right? It's going to change everything. You combine AI with Internet of Things, that means things that we own get smarter, and they start doing their own thing. Any comments from the group in terms of how AI is going to change telecommunications? I, I can may maybe speak just to the DWDM side. Where I've seen AI make a difference is the way you know, manufacturers like Sienna have applied uh, artificial intelligence to the ITU grid to be able to make more efficient use of the spectrum. It's about, that's about the depth of where I've seen AI affect us, which is great, you know, it brought us flex grid and getting rid of the channel guards and making better use of the spectrum. Um, sure, potential is there, the, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, applications, uh, but I, I think there's probably a, maybe a bit of a slowdown coming for IoT and AI. I think that's really just due to supply lines, uh, industrial inputs needed to make things like semiconductors, and the, the trouble that maybe the whole civilized world is in right now, uh, given the potential shortage of very crucial industrial inputs to make these things. And I don't think there's really any good answers to those things. There's, there's just a lot of questions, and you know, even folks like Sienna can't, can't really answer the question of what are you gonna do what is ASML going to do without having neon gas? Yeah, the shortage of neon gas, I think, is a huge problem that's not being focused on that's going to affect what semiconductors are made, the volume that they're made in, and, and what levels are made. Probably the low end is going to suffer. You know, automotive, um, aerospace, um, our laptops, our cell phones, our servers, we'll, we'll still have those chips. But I think the, the lower end stuff, which is all, pretty much all of IoT, 
you know, Peter's singing washer, uh, we may have to make some sacrifices in the future as to what items we're going to want to connect. Peter's wash won't get done any faster because... It just won't sing at the <laughs> end when it's done. Yeah. I know that uh, my, uh, a seed company, I'm not going to say who it is because I don't have permission from them, uh, has put thousands of a IoT sensors in fields that detect water usage and then change using AI how much water the farmer needs to essentially water the plants and uh, saves on water and then increases uh, crop production all using AI. Now that's not telecom infrastructure, but that's using the telecom infrastructure to communicate back from the field to the rural area, to the broadband that's now reaching the farm, that's then wired on transport all the way back to a major city in order to get all of that information that's then done in the cloud or using AI. So it, it has far reaching uh, tentacles, let's say, to, to the benefit of the consumer in this case. I'm gonna go to Chris, Yope, and end with you in the last word, Pat. Uh, Chris, AI, your business, are you gonna see more edge nodes because of AI? Because they wanna have some applications sit in your data center, be more local to the folks they serve? Yeah, well, I'll say one thing. I, and I don't know how much of it on the network side is AI yet. I mean, we're definitely seeing impacts of AI on our business, and you can read more publicly about them on the broader data center business. Um, for example, I, I saw recently Meta stopping um, designs of big, large data center campuses they already had in, 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 in process in order to redesign for higher rack density uh, to accommodate AI. And we've definitely seen that in the last 18 months. It's like a switch came on. And, you know, all of a sudden we had this long operating history of rack densities in the single digits of kilowatts per rack. And every quote that came in, it seemed like they wanted more power than the last quote. And so as GPU deployment has, it has spread out, um, it's really driving demand for much denser data centers, which have, they are not the data centers we used to build in order to be able to do 25, 30 or more kilo, kilowatts a rack requires very specialized cooling. You might need to do, you know, almost localized cooling at the rack level. So lots of challenges and impacts. I'll say on the network, I don't know if it's all AI. Um, I don't know that I agree that IoT is slowing down. I mean, we, we see data localization from IT, I, I, IoT, where because so, many, so much more data is generated locally, um, there, we definitely see applications where people are storing data local because if, if you have a really voluminous um, data set, a lot of data gravity from an IoT app, it doesn't make sense to push that data way up into the cloud um, if its use is more local. So we see edge use cases related to IoT and data storage. Uh, and the other thing we're seeing is increasing density on network deployments. So I'm, I'm working with one, you know, th th there are hyperscalers out there that are doing network nodes now where the network equipment alone is in the, is in the multi megawatts. And I mean, think about that historically telecom, I mean, I've been telecom my whole career. A 4KW rack was a lot, you know, for, for network gear. And then we went to 8KW racks and now you know, we're seeing use cases for multi-megawatt deployments of only network gear. So how much AI is going on, I don't know, but that is a lot of network function virtualization where I could see AI could inform, but it's definitely getting a lot more dense. Yo? Well, I, I, I do see a lot of AI. Well, first of all, IoT is not, I don't think it's slowing down. I think it's actually getting more and more. It's, uh, it's and, and maybe in, in the US, I'm not sure if the US is slowing down, but I, I, I would hardly imagine it would be slowing down. But from an AI perspective, you know, it, it, AI does have a very big impact on network connectivity. It, it, does, it does increase the communication level on things. And I see, uh, particularly in uh, engineering and um, uh, construction, a lot of AI coming where they can actually on site using the, the designs that they have in, in the cloud that they can make changes that uh, immediately get the approvals on, uh, on the designs using their AI capabilities, etc. So I do think there's a lot of, uh, lot of changes on, uh, on, uh, on AI. It drives network, the gigabits on the network, uh, network link from an access perspective. So you do need to have higher access methodologies and higher access uh, uh, capabilities. Um, the fixed wireless access or just the mobile connectivity is, is getting better and better with, uh, with the 
um, you know, even with 5G deployments and, and, and backhauls from the carriers into their infrastructures makes 4G even faster. They still use 4G as, the bad, as, the, as, as most of the backhaul for, uh, for 5G networks. Once that's completed and you have 5G standalone, then you will see a major difference in, uh, in, the, in the capabilities of, uh, of uh, and more applications of AI coming towards, uh, towards, uh, towards the field. Before I give Pat the last word, I'm going to give you an example of IoT and AI coming together. So police departments in this country have given out cameras to a lot of their officers. But the reality is less than 2% of the videos ever watched. They don't have time. Who can sit and watch all these cameras? There's an application being developed in this country now where you can, you can have that camera go up to a wireless get read by an AI application and then have someone look at it that should be looking at it for an application for training, for example. So if an officer is in a situation on a repetitive basis that deserves to have someone look at it, they can actually have an AI application, flag it, and kind of go back at it. I leave that one for you because New York City is one of my favorite cities and one of the largest police departments in the country. Um, your thoughts on your platform, AI, IoT, I would think it's right up your wheelhouse. I'm going to put you on the spot, but I think you got a great application for this. We do, thanks. But, um, you know, from an AI perspective, you know, we're a network infrastructure company, and like Yoke was saying, we're not, we're not really there yet. You know, what Alan was talking about with Sienna, we haven't gone up the stack yet as a company. We're, we're thinking about how we, um, you know, monetize the fiber network a little more besides that. So from, a, from an AI perspective, um, the new Bolden Networks logo was uh, generated using AI prompts, so boldennetworks.com, you can go check that out. And that's what we know about AI at the moment. Second point with IoT is uh, BAI Communications in UK is in partnership with the city of Sunderland to do a trial of a an, an connected city. So the things that Peter was talking about, they have put rain sensors in the streets there and, and you know, connecting the bus stops and the buses back and, and it, it really takes a city going all in and saying we're going to partner with somebody and we're going to spend the money to really connect our citizens around IOT. Um, and I think we're seeing that as a use case, as a trial, and we'll see where that goes. But again, you can go on BAIcommunications.com and check out the city of Sunderland uh, trial that we're doing. There's a lot of good information about what's going on there. And the last point I'll make, Gil, is please tell all your friends in New Jersey I will gladly take a shakedown if someone will tell me when I'm going to get a permit back. When I'll I'm take trying that to, one offline with you and I will help New you in New Jersey. Jersey. Just tell me how much it needs to be in the envelope. <laughs> I'll do it. Just stay out of the city of Newark. That's all I got to warn you. <laughs> anyway, that concludes our session. Appreciate the panelists. Thank you. Please round of applause for our folks today. Thank you all. That's our last session of the day. So thank you all for joining us. And I'm sure you agree it was a great end to the day. So thank you, Gil, and all the panelists. And have a nice drink, everyone. <laughs>